Hello everyone and welcome to the SFL webinar series. My name is Leah Paul Gashvili and I am the director of the SFL webinar series and an executive board member of SFL. We are honored to have Professor Ben Powell deliver a talk on No Sweat, How Sweatshops Improve Lives and Promote Economic Growth. Before we begin though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Students for Liberty and the webinar series. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization run by students and for students dedicated to liberty. We were formed three years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche in our universities, connecting liberty-friendly students with other students, faculty, organizations, and resources to help them advance their ideas and applications of classical liberalism. The resources we offer include free books for student groups, a speaker's network, protest grants, handbooks on running a student organization, tabling kits, leadership training, an academic journal for liberty and society, and our bread and butter conferences. The SFL webinar series is a way of giving you access to the ideas and mentorship, mentorship and liberty year-round from wherever you are. We hold webinars each week to put you in touch with the top mentors and scholars for liberty in the country. For a full list, please visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. Tonight's webinar, we have Ben Powell. Ben Powell is an associate professor of economics at Suffolk University. Uh, the president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education, a senior economist with the Beacon Hill Institute, and a senior fellow with the Independent Institute. He earned his BS in economics and finance from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell and his MA and PhD in economics from George Mason University. Professor Powell is the editor of Making Poor Nations Rich, Entrepreneurship and the Process of Development, and the co-editor of Housing America, Building Out a Crisis. He is the author of more than 50 scholarly articles and policy studies. His primary fields of interest are economic development, Austrian economics, and public choice. Just to note, there will be 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. Feel free to type in any questions into the question box. For those interested, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website in the next few weeks. We will be sending you more detailed information about Students for Liberty and, our, and other upcoming webinars in the follow-up email. Without further ado, I present to you Professor Ben Powell. All right. Thank you very much, Leah, and hello, Students for Liberty. It's a pleasure to talk to you all. I think you have a, a great organization and a growing movement uh, that's encouraging for the future of uh, the United States and, and liberty more broadly. Uh, happy to talk to you tonight on uh, a topic that I've been studying for close to 10 years now is sweatshops. And the, the title of the talk tonight, No Sweat, How Sweatshops Improve Lives and Economic Growth, is also the working title of a book I'm just about to finish up. Um, in some sense, I'm always hesitant to give a talk to a group like Students for Liberty on sweatshops, because for you, I think the issue of sweatshops, well, if you're Students for Liberty, I don't think it should be all that controversial that sweatshops improve lives and economic growth. When I give this talk on college campuses, it's a much different audience that I'm talking to, where I've been called all sorts of names and other things and have to explain the basic economics of it. That said, I think tonight while talking to you, for those of you who are already broadly in agreement with the position, I'm going to give you new arguments that you haven't made before and new empirical evidence that you can use. Uh, and for those who are skeptical, hopefully I will bring you along to our side of the debate. So first, I'd like to just take a picture of inside a sweatshop, because I am going to share charts and numbers with you later. But put, to put a human face on it, this is the inside of a sweatshop. Uh, obviously, working conditions that you or I probably would not want to work in. They're cramped in there. It's obviously hot. Workers, some of them don't have their shirts on. There is a fan, but if you notice in the back, you can also see the blades of that fan, which means it's not moving. They're smiling, but someone probably said, say, cheese for the camera, um, not a place where you or I would aspire to work. But what we have to keep in mind with sweatshops is not what you and I would like to do for a job, but what the relevant alternatives are. Subsistence agriculture, working in the fields. If you've been to a poorer country, you've often probably seen people going and harvesting wood from common areas to bring back and sell for fuel, or much worse, just destitute begging starvation. These are often the alternatives people who choose to work in sweatshops face. So let's start by defining what we mean by a sweatshop. Because a sweatshop is a bit of a squishy term. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. So the sweatshops I'm going to be talking about all have very low wages. 
at least by U.S. standards, and have poor working conditions. So when I'm talking about a sweatshop, I'm talking about a place where workers compared to the United States earn very little, where they might be at risk for injury at work or have health problems, where hours are long, overtime may be unpredictable and demanded, um, bathroom breaks short or non-existent, same for lunch breaks. Just poor working conditions, but with the important caveat that despite all of the bad working conditions, the workers choose to work there. And that choice is important. That choice is important on moral grounds, and that choice is important on economic grounds. On economic grounds, if a worker freely chooses that job, they are demonstrating that it is their best available alternative. Admittedly, from a bad choice set. But still, that means for first world activists, if you're trying to help those workers, what you cannot do is jeopardize their first best alternative. Instead, you have to open new alternatives for them without sacrificing that as one of their options. And unfortunately, all too often, I think anti-sweatshop activists end up doing things that jeopardize that best alternative and end up throwing them into even worse ones. There's one type of sweatshop I will not be talking about tonight, and that's sweatshops that literally depend on the force uh, on the on forced labor. So sweatshops where their workers are there either on the threat of violence from the employer or the government on that employer's behalf. That is slave labor that is outside of this analysis. It's clearly not the worker's best alternative if you have to threaten them to get them to work there. Um, I think it should be opposed by anti-sweatshop groups and all decent humans. Um, with that caveat in place, the ones I'm talking about, where workers voluntarily choose to work there, economists pretty much across the political spectrum have taken a gains from trade perspective to this. Uh, you know, it's uh, I, I hate to cite him because he usually makes me nuts, uh, but Paul Krugman, at least back when he acted like an economist, he wrote an article, Bad Jobs at Bad Wages or Better Than No Jobs at All, defending a basically gains from trade perspective of sweatshop employment. That Employers hire the workers because they expect to profit, and workers choose to work there because it's their best available alternative. So often the alternatives are really bad. The New York Times reports in Cambodia hundreds of people scavenge for plastic bags, middle cans, bits of food, and trash dumps. And it mentions one particular worker who are, uh, averages 75 cents a day for her efforts. For her, the idea of being exploited in a garment factory working only six days a week inside, instead of seven days a week in the broiling sun for up to two dollars a day is a dream. Now, of course, we want to do things to make that dream better, but we also don't want to jeopardize that job. And the economist in me, the first time I looked at this, compared the two dollars a day to the 75 cents, it's clearly a better job. But there was a margin here that I was missing, and that's the word inside, six days a week inside instead of seven in the broiling sun. And as I've done more on sweatshops, it's become clear to me that workers attach a benefit to moving from working outdoors to moving indoors and working in a factory. Uh, the first time this happened, I was in Guatemala. I've been there a number of times. Uh, in fact, for Students for Liberty, by the way, there's an excellent, probably the most liberty-focused university in the world, the University of Francisco Medicaid, uh in Guatemala City, but I've done a number, a number of things with over the past. And uh, when I was down there, which, by the way, everybody at that university, doesn't matter if you're a dental major or an architect major or an economics major, everybody has a core requirement. Like your colleges probably have a requirement of you must take English Comp 1 and 2. There you have to take a course in Mises and a course in Hayek. How cool is that? Anyhow, uh, one of the times I was down in Guatemala, I was up, I, I tend to subsidize my, my hiking and climbing habit with uh, economics. So I was down there for work, and I went out to hike the Catanango and Fuego, a couple of volcanoes. And while I was coming off of uh, the Catanango, going down in the lower areas, there was a man working out in the fields, and he was acting pretty much like an ox. I mean, he had a cross piece on his shoulder and two large logs being dragged behind that he was pulling down. And I, I had a hiking guide, not because the mountain was particularly tough, but because the cost of labor was low, and they provided tents and sleeping bags and food, so I didn't have to pack that stuff for an airplane. 
uh, and more importantly, maybe transit. Uh, in any event, while coming down, we saw him working in the fields, and I asked the, the guy, how much does he make? And he told me in Katsavis, I don't, I don't remember the number right now, but it basically translated into about a, a beer, beer and a half per day. This is how I do foreign currency conversions, is figure out how much a beer costs in foreign currency, and then you just equate everything into that, uh, and it makes exchange rates easy the rest of the time you're in the country. Um, and then I asked the, the guide, well, how much does working in a garment factory make for you? And he didn't really want to answer. So, well, it depends. And he equivocated and danced around it a little bit. And just, but no, an entry level, not inside Guatemala City. And he finally gave an answer about two, two and a half beers per day, uh, equivalent. But before I could say anything, and he didn't know I worked on switch shops, he said, but that is inside, not outside in the field like him. Like there is a difference to that. Uh, this is a picture I took that day while I was just coming down of two people carrying away some of the wood that the man had been dragging down and getting chopped up. And also it relates to children because child labor is part of this and often when people protest children working in sweatshops, they have some vision that the children will have some middle class education otherwise, but often the alternative is that they'll just work in a less productive sector. These children, it's a little bit hard to tell from the picture, this is a different time that I was down in Guatemala, uh, probably somewhere between 9 and 12 years old, it's a little bit hard to tell. Uh, this was not a weekend, they weren't out in the family garden, they were working because that was the best available alternative to them. Knocking children out of a sweatshop often results in them working on the farm, and while they might earn less there, they also build less human capital and are essentially in training to become like the man who is functioning like an ox. Sometimes the alternative for children are even worse. Oxfam reported on a case in Bangladesh in 1993, Tom Harkin, a representative in the United States, uh, was pushing a bill that would ban imports from Bangladesh because they were using child labor. And this factory was pressured into firing its child employees, according to Oxfam. Thousands of the children became prostitutes or starved. Clearly, childhood prostitution or starvation are worse alternatives to sweatshops. So, with that in mind, what we have to think about then is what determines the level of compensation, the mix of compensation, and make sure that what activists do don't violate the laws of economics here when you might throw them into these worse alternatives. So first, level of compensation. Two bounds, really simple. Upper bound, worker productivity. The most a firm is ever willing to pay a worker is the amount they contribute to the firm's revenue. If you have someone who can create $2 an hour of value for you, but you must pay them $2.01, every hour they work, you lose one cent. That's a worker you fire or never employ in the first place. That's the upper bound. Now, the lower bound, because of course a firm does not want to pay $2 if the worker creates $2. They'd like to pay zero and net $2 per hour that employee works in profits. Um, but the employee won't take zero. It depends what their lower bound is. The lowest you can pay an employee to get them to take a job is how much they can make in their next best alternative, or more broadly, just how much they value their next best alternative. So if we're going to address employee wages, it has to be addressing one of these two bounds, either raising their level of productivity so their upper bound is higher, or giving them more better alternatives so the choice isn't become a child prostitute or stitch for Nike. Instead, it's stitch for Nike or stitch for Reebok. Uh, in practice, the game is mostly about raising the upper bound. When we look at uh, various economies and the differences in their, their labor forces, it's basically about 80% of the difference in wages can be explained by differences in productivity. So that's telling you the lion's share of the game is in the upper bound. But also, there's some to do in the lower bound. Now, some people will say, okay, we understand wages, that we can't just mandate higher wages and that it'll all work out because they'll get unemployed. But if the real problem is the bad working conditions. We should just make the jobs healthier and safer for the workers and give them more predictable hours and shorter hours. But firms don't care about the mix of compensation. To a firm, if you have an employee who creates $2 an hour of value, you're indifferent between paying that employee $2 an hour in wages or paying them $1 an hour in wages and $1 an hour in other health, safety, comfort, leisure, predictability of overtime benefits. 
to you, all of them are just a cost. It's off your bottom line. You want to minimize the total, but how it's divided between wages and other things, you're largely indifferent from, about. And I say largely because, of course, some health and safety benefits make your workers more productive. And to that extent, you want them to actually have more of those so that they can create greater value. But for those beyond that, basically don't care. A cost is a cost is a cost. You want to min minimize the package, not how it's divided. Who does care? Workers care. Workers care a lot about whether they get it in wages or in other health and safety benefits. For those of you who have part-time jobs, ask yourself, would you take a 50% reduction in wages in order to have an increase in some of your margins of non-monetary compensation? I bet you, for most of you, the answer is no. Now think about sweatshop employees who are very poor and desperately trying to feed and clothe their families. For them, they want the lion's share of their compensation and wages and are willing to sacrifice health, safety, and all sorts of other things in order to feed, clothe, and shelter their families. As their incomes go up, eventually they'll demand more health and safety, but while their productivity is very low, they want most of the benefits and wages, not these other things. This tells us that contrary to claims of first world activists, that the mix of compensation isn't dictated by some evil multinational corporation, but instead is largely driven by employee preferences because an employer has every incentive to make the mix constrained by how productive the employee is, but the mix reflect the employee wishes. Anytime they don't, they're giving the employee a benefit that is worth less to the employee than the cost to the employer. That means they can remix it and make the employee equally satisfied for less cost to them. So mix of compensation constrained by how productive the employee is, is largely driven by employee preferences, not employer. So the debate about compensation and working conditions is tied. You can't separate the two. Finally, some people will say, well, what about exorbitant profits? Nike earns millions of dollars. They wouldn't just close if Nike had to pay some of those dollars to their employees instead of having profits. Well, of course, but economics is a science about adjustments on the margin. Just because they have profits doesn't mean that they become charities. The firm is still a profit-maximizing firm. If you raise the cost of labor, they're going to economize on labor, or at least third world labor, and use its substitutes, more capital and fewer workers or more first world laborers and fewer third world laborers. So just because firms make profits and wouldn't just shut down doesn't mean there's a source of wealth you can grab. Instead, if you mandate that they give more of it to workers, they will still profit maximize, leading them to use fewer of those workers, throwing many into worse alternatives. So this is one sweatshop I visited in Guatemala, and this is about the mix of compensation. I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, this firm here, the National Labor Committee in the United States, protested for all of the working conditions that they had there. Um, this is me, by the way, hi, since you can't actually see me. That's me inside that Guatemalan sweatshop. Uh, appropriately enough, apparently, I sweated, as you might see from an armpit there. It had nothing to do with the temperature inside the firm. It was mostly the car ride there. Uh, that, and I guess I'm just a sweaty person. Uh, but uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a cramped working condition, but it's not that appalling of a factory, as all turns out. Anyhow, the National Labor Committee had lots of complaints against this firm. Uh, so I surveyed, without the employer's permission first, I surveyed the workers there, what they thought about their working conditions and compensation. And then I went to visit the firm a little bit later and, and met the owner as well. Uh, these are questions I asked them inspired by the complaints by the National Labor Committee. Are you willing to work for lower pay if you're an employer? And then we give them all of these choices. Reduce the number of hours you have to work. Made your hours more predictable. Gave you more bathroom breaks. Gave you more lunch breaks. Made your working conditions more pleasant. Made your working conditions safer. Provided health insurance. Gave you paid vacation. Treated you more fairly or reduced the risk of sexual harassment. Uh, there's two, two firms, Sam Bridge and Nicotex, that were both protested in Guatemala from the National Labor Committee, and I surveyed the workers at both. For our purposes right now, just look over to the far right column where its total is putting the two firms together. Uh, when you look down, are you willing to work for lower pay if you're an employer? Look at the no's. 
90%, 91%, 90%, as you go down, it's overwhelming. Given the constraint of how much they're going to be compensated, the workers like the current mix of compensation. Uh, give you paid vacation, got the greatest compliance at 81.4%, saying no, meaning only about 19% would have accepted lower wages in order to have it. The overwhelming answer here is the mix of compensation reflects employee preferences, not employer preferences. So back to this old slide. We'll move on because I already did exorbitant profits. All right, anti-sweatshop movement. Curious bunch. You got celebrities, you got ministers, politicians, academics, labor unions, some student groups, happily not students for liberty, because otherwise that'd be really freaking strange. Uh, but uh, United Students Against Sweatshops, who I have in mind with them. Major players unite National Labor Committee. Uh, National Labor Committee is the one I was dealing with in those Guatemalan sweatshops. Uh, unite as a garment workers union in the United States. AFL CIO has been involved in the fact funds United Students Against Sweatshops. Uh, which is a group that started in 1997 at Duke University after doing labor uh, union summer internships at a bunch of places. Uh, the students went back to their campuses and then started their anti-sweatshop groups. Some of you probably have some on your campus. Um, things that they call for international labor standards, so minim, uh, mandating particular health and safety uh, packages. Minimum and living wages including those higher than worker productivity that will endanger the jobs. I put right to organize in quotation marks because they don't just mean the right to collectively bargain as a group if all of you want to get together and bargain as a group. They mean the right for 51% of you to decide that 100% of you have to bargain as a group even if 49% do not want to. That's forced association, not just freedom of association. We need to distinguish those two things. And probably one of the worst things that you can do for sweatshop workers is boycott. In this case, the Gap, Old Navy stores. It also throws in there, save the Redwoods, so it's got to be like a Santa Cruz thing or something in California. Uh, I'm not really sure how the two are related. But boycott them or boycott Nike. Boycott bad for workers because it instantly lowers the upper bound. So if you stop buying products precisely because they're made in a sweatshop, the way the companies have to deal with that is lower the price of the product in order to sell it. Lower the price of product and then nothing has changed about the physical ability of the workers to produce value by sewing. Their physical productivity is exactly the same, but the amount of value they create for a given amount of physical effort is lower. As a result, their upper bound drops through no fault of their own. Boycotts are a horrible thing that you could do for sweatshop workers. I'm embarrassed to say that there are even some economists who have been involved in the anti-sweatshop movement. There's a group, Scholars Against Sweatshop Labor. At 434 signatories, uh, I say some of the usual suspects, as in the last bastions of Marxism in the United States, economics departments anyway, history departments are right, uh, UMass, Notre Dame, and the New School, but then also some just liberal establishments of Harvard and UC Berkeley. Um, they circulated a letter in support of the anti-sweatshop movement to counter a letter from international trade economists. The international trade economists had basically set a, a letter around telling university presidents, hey, don't ban products made with sweatshops from your bookstore that only hurt the workers. Um, but the scholars against sweatshop labor pointed out that while multinationals pay workers more than domestic firms in the third world, they say, hey, that's true, but it does not speak to the situation in which most garments are produced throughout the world, which is by firms subcontracted by the multinationals, not the multinationals themselves. So while Walmart, The Gap, Old Navy, whoever might be protested Nike, it's usually not them who are literally paying the workers. There's some subcontractor working for them, making their product that's getting paid. And the empirical evidence just wasn't there on that. So that's what got me interested in studying sweatshops. Actually, a, a former student of mine, now professor at Duke, David Scarbeck, uh, and I got involved in trying to figure out what the empirical evidence would be then. So we needed to put together a database on sweatshop labor. And it's hard to do because there's no hard and fast line of what exactly a sweatshop is. Well, we can list the general characteristics 
how low does the wage have to be? How long do the hours have to be? How bad do the working conditions have to be? We didn't want to pick the line ourselves for each of these categories. So what we did was we searched LexisNexis US news sources and just looked for everything that had been protested as a sweatshop and took the protesters' definition at face value. If it was bad enough for them to call a sweatshop and protest in news sources, that's a sweatshop we'll study. And then we put together a list of countries where these places were located. Um, and then looked first at the apparel industry and the average wages that they made in these countries. And the wages by U.S. standards are appallingly low. Of course, Bangladesh is the lowest at 13 cents. I think Costa Rica is the highest at $2.38. But this doesn't tell you how they compare to the other alternatives in these countries. So that's what we do here. We compare it at either a 40, 50, 60, or 70 hour work week. And of course, one of the characteristics of sweatshops is long hours. So it's basically the 60 and 70 hour bars that we're most concerned with here. We show how working in the apparel industry in these countries that use sweatshops, how that translates compared to the average standard of living. This is your 100% line. Every time the sweatshops lines are above that, that means the workers are earning more than average, basically every case. And in most cases, more than twice the national average, in some of them, more than three times the national average. In places like Haiti, we're approaching five times. Honduras, more than seven. Nicaragua, almost eight times national average. Perspective here, if this were a graph for the United States and we were showing this, these jobs as a percent of national income, this 100% line would be around $40,000 per year. Protesting a sweatshop job in the apparel industry in Honduras seven times would be like protesting a job that pays $280,000 in the United States as a bad job. These jobs aren't just better than the workers' next best alternative. They're better than the vast majority of alternatives in the economies where they are. We could also compare them to poverty living conditions, the percent of people living on less than $1 or $2 a day. Big chunks of the population of most of these countries live on less than that. But in nine of the 10 countries, working a 10-hour workday in the apparel industry with a workers above the $2 per day threshold. Bangladesh is the one exception. It raises them above the $1 per day threshold. 36% of the population doesn't achieve it, and less than 20% gets over $2 a day there. Next, we can compare it to the actual worst of the worst, the protested sweatshops. So same data source, but this time, instead of looking at the apparel industry generally, we'll look at the actual sweatshops that were protested. Now, the wage data on this isn't perfect. It comes from the newspaper articles documenting the sweatshops. So for one, we don't know what exchange rate was used. Uh, I don't have any reason to think there's a systematic bias from that, just a little bit of noise in the data. Uh, but it does come from often people protesting sweatshops telling the reporter how bad the wages are. If there's anybody who has an incentive to understate the wages in order to say how bad the job are, is, it's these people. So there might be a bias in the data that way. But to the extent it does, it makes my point harder to prove. Uh, so I'm comfortable with it being in there if I can still make my point. So this here is the face of some sweatshop employers. This is Mary Kate and Ashley at Walmart. That was supposed to be P. Diddy, but someone told me in a public lecture I gave that it was actually 50 cents. Sorry, I'm not up on my wrappers and I haven't changed the picture yet. Um, here's our list of sweatshop protests. Uh, the country where they were, the year when we have it, the company they were associated with, and the wage being paid. And this list is bigger uh, in terms of number of countries than the previous thing I showed you because I've been updating this for the book. So I recently just went through uh, with the help of my student research assistant and updated everything from when Scarbeck and I did it. We did it, I think, from 1995 to about 2003 or four. Um, so now we've updated it up through 2010, all of the different cases that we can find. Um, so Bangladesh, you have a number of them. That's our Mary Kate and Ashley there. Uh, for various fairly low wages, a couple in Brazil, Burma, uh, Cambodia, China, a whole bunch. Most of them are apparel companies. Occasionally you get technology ones more recently. Uh, a lot with licensing from NFL, NBA, uh, or baseball. Some Nike, there's a gap in El Salvador. More of these in Haiti. Oh, there's the P. Diddy. Got them there. 
Uh, Walmart Kathy Lee, this is the famous episode where uh, Charles Kernigan from the National Labor Committee confronted her on national television and said, Kathy Lee Gifford, your products are being made. She, he brought this girl, Wendy Diaz, a worker in her Honduran sweatshop on television and said that you're only paying her 31 cents an hour, you're exploiting her. And Kathy Lee burst into tears and apologized on the air. And I have a, a chapter in my new book called Don't Cry For Me, Kathy Lee, Sweatshop Wages Compared to Alternatives, because at 31 cents an hour or $3.10 a day, Wendy Diaz was making more than the vast majority of Hondurans. In fact, what we should be crying for is her sisters or cousins who weren't lucky enough to have a job in Kathy Lee's sweatshop. Um, a number in India more recently, a bunch in Indonesia from Nike, remember that. Um, Kohl's, more some more in Nike down here. So an oddity is South Africa and Mauritius, a couple from Africa, but for the most part we're Latin America or Asia. So what we do then is we compare the average sweatshop income to the average income in each country. This slide looks a little wordy. Here's the basic thing. We make sure that we don't have apples to apples here, meaning we average the sweatshop wages and then we average the average national incomes. Basically, we just weight it since we have different multiple years that we're comparing, so that we're comparing uh, same inflation adjusted incomes, we'll call it. Here's what we find. Not as dramatic as when we look at the apparel industry generally. Here's a 50% line, here's a 100% line. Every time it's above 100%, it's paying more than the average national income to work in the very sweatshops that are protesting. That's true in Vietnam, Nicaragua, India is basically at the 100% line, Honduras, Haiti, um, Costa Rica, Cambodia. Some of them hitting twice average national income, but the very places that are protesting. Others that are in about you know, 70 to 80% range, uh, Bangladesh, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, eh, it's about 65% or so. Uh, Indonesia, Laos getting closer uh, down. But a lot of them, and by the way, just because it's below the 100% line doesn't make it bad. It just means that it's less than average. And almost by definition, half of your jobs will have to be below average. There are some exceptions here of seemingly far below. Brazil, China, Mauritius, South Africa, Thailand. Interesting though, on all of these, when you actually look at the articles and what they're documenting, in Brazil, it wasn't Brazilians working, it was Bolivians, illegal immigrants from Bolivia to Brazil working in the sweatshops who were transported there. If we actually compared them with Bolivian national income, they're well above 100%. China, there's huge differences between rural and urban areas there. Income inequality is huge. So often it's the case that it's rural Chinese workers who have very few alternatives who move to the industrial area and earn much higher wages than they could where they were from, but as a percent of Chinese income, it looks lower. Also, again, there's some immigration there, um, which is also what came up with Mauritius. It's none of the natives. It's Indians, Bangladeshis uh, who are going to work there, and compared to their home income, it's much higher. South Africa, uh, so Thailand was more of the same. It was people from Myanmar who were crossing the border and, and working around there, again, earning much more than they could in their home country. South Africa is the exception. It was South Africans. But in this case, there was a national minimum wage based on urban wage rates that they tried to enforce in rural areas. When the enforcement agencies showed up, the workers rioted and assaulted them and threw them out. Uh, so it was clearly a case that the workers were upset that they were, uh, their jobs were going to be jeopardized by this law. It's clearly not something making them worse off. Um, so basically, the, the story being told by this is in some countries, it's multiples above average. In others, it's somewhere close to around average. In the very places that we're protesting, to the exceptions where they're much lower, it's actually not a good relative comparison because it's usually immigrants that we're talking about. We're doing better than their alternative. So the basic idea, when workers voluntarily choose a job, it's because they view it as their best alternative. Makes a lot of sense when you look at the data. 
Um, we can also compare it to people working on less than one or two dollars per day adjusting for purchasing power parity. We have significant fractions of the population in most of these countries uh, below those thresholds. The blue line being the one dollar per day, the red being the two. But average sweatshop earnings per day adjusted for purchasing power parity again, in every case, bring you above the $2 a day standard, most of the time more than double it, sometimes many multiples higher. In particular for the Latin American countries that didn't have too many workers below those standards, look at how much sweatshops are paying. Costa Rica, $16 per day. Dominican Republic, 11-ish. El Salvador, 10. Honduras, 12. Nicaragua, way up there, it's way above. So while you can write cartoons like this in the United States, look on the bright side. No one will ever mug you for your paycheck. Uh, it's just not empirically the truth in these countries. If you're going to mug somebody who's not a tourist, it should be the sweatshop worker. Now, from there, does this mean nothing can be done from activists from the outside? And I give you this example only slightly tongue-in-cheek, but how about air sweatshops? So Air sweatshop. It's kind of the anti-boycott. Just think about Nike and Air Jordan. As far as I know, Michael Jordan's never stitched a shoe in his life. Nike pays him millions of dollars. Why? Because he creates value in consumers' minds. Maybe because you all want to be like Mike. But the fact that calling it Air Jordan and getting his endorsement makes you more willing to pay for it means he's a productive worker for Nike. He creates value. Well, now, instead of recoiling from sweatshop shoes, how about making them air sweatshops? Advertise the fact that they're made in sweatshops, and maybe that the workers are paid a little bit more than the going market rate. And if, as a result, consumers, that creates extra value in their mind, then the upper bound of employees has been raised without any physical productivity changing. Basically, it's a form of, eth of so-called ethical branding. Because, by the way, I say so-called because I don't think normal branding is unethical. Um, but in this case, then, it's something bonus. The workers get a little bit more productive without anything changing. And I think this is something that can't be mandated, but it's a niche market for firms to explore as a branding strategy like anything else. However, much like fair trade coffee, I think we have to worry about how much people want to do good versus actually do good. So this is a shop with the conscious consumer guide. They guarantee that all of the products that you can buy from their website are made in sweat-free conditions where the workers are paid reasonable wages, have good working conditions, and the right to organize. Well, I've mapped out where their source plants are located. Is this doing anything to help third world workers? You might feel good about yourself, but basically you're shifting your consumption to first world unionized producers at the expense of third world producers. This is not helping poor workers in third countries, third world countries. This is taking their jobs away and giving it to already wealthy Americans. But most people don't take the step to actually look and think about this. As a result, a lot of the branding that goes on is BS marketing that really doesn't help the third world. There's a difference between doing good and feeling good about yourself that unfortunately not too many people are willing to make the bridge between. So the real cure for these places is the process of economic development. Sweatshops are not new. They existed in Great Britain and the United States and virtually every country that's industrialized. What happens is you have to increase labor productivity and then sweatshops go away. Increasing labor productivity, the proximate causes, are getting better technology, more physical capital, and more human capital improvements. When you do, the upper bound improves, as does the lower bound. As a result, workers are paid more, and since leisure, comfort, safety, child leisure are all normal goods, workers demand more of them as their productivity increases. So that's the real game. Uh, unfortunately, I think policies that risk raising compensation above productivity risk cutting short the very process that raises wages. If you do something that mandates higher pay or better working conditions before productivity justifies it, the jobs disappear. That means the sweatshops don't come in and bring with them new technology compared to the domestic alternatives, more capital, or 
giving the workers the opportunity to build physical capital there. So this is the danger of the anti-sweatshop movement is cutting this whole process short. And it is a process, which means it's not a magic pill, you can't do it tomorrow. But the good news is the process can happen more quickly than it could in the past. In Great Britain and the United States, you're talking roughly a 100 to 150 year process. But think back, well, before I was born, and definitely before you were all born, but post-World War II, made in Hong Kong, made in Taiwan, these things used to, made in South Korea, it used to be like a joke. These were the sweatshop countries. But they went through this process of development much quicker than Germany, Britain, the United States did. They did it in about a generation and a half, going from poverty living standards to first world status. And that's because the technology's out there, the physical capital's out there. Get your institutions right and it flows in and your process can happen much quicker. In Great Britain and the United States, it, happened to ha it had to be, all the new capital had to be formed and the technology had to be created. But today it's out there and if you get your institutions right, the process can happen more quickly. So punchline here, before I open this up to Q&A, is the apparel industry wages and even the very sweatshops that have been protested are better than the alternatives. After all, there's a reason the workers choose to work there. Uh, wages are low because productivity is low and worker alternatives are limited. So the best cure for both of these is the process of economic development, things that raise worker productivity and give them more alternatives. Unfortunately, I think most of what the anti-sweatshop groups do uh, jeopardizes this very process. Now, the real game is institutional reform in the third world. That's what's needed. Unfortunately, from a perspective of first world activists, there's very little that you can do for that. Uh, constitutions don't enforce themselves. You simply can't invade a country and then give them a US constitution and expect them to enforce it. Uh, it's the hearts and minds of the people, which means it's an ideological battle to get them to believe in the norms of property rights and economic freedoms and then enforce it on their government. Uh, that's not something that's easily done from the outside. Some things that you can do agitate for freer trade. Uh, one, it makes them better off in the short run, and two, there's some evidence for contagious capitalism where more free countries who trade with less free countries help to improve the freedom of the less free countries, but that's still marginal. Ultimately, it's an ideological battle. If activists want to be concerned with something, they should work with groups like the Atlas Foundation who go around and try to start up think tanks in these countries to spread these ideas. Um, but in the short run at least, you as a consumer activist should be concerned with buying the products of sweatshops. So until they go through the process of development, I love sweatshop labor and so should you because it's in the best interest of the workers today and part of the process that will guarantee that future workers have a higher standard of living. With that, I look forward to some questions from all of you. Please feel free to push me on any margin of this. I'll look forward to our interactions. Leah, I guess I turn it back to you to moderate. Yep, thank you, Ben. And we'll start Q&A, so um, you guys should all see a Q&A box. Um, just type in your questions there and I'll read them to Ben. Uh, the first question is just a quick clarifying question. Someone asked, um, did you have a translator at the Guatemalan sweatshop or did you translate the questions into Spanish or another uh, language? Yes, awesome. One of my TAs, Nicholas Kachineski, who is an awesome student and who's going to get his PhD in a couple of years, uh, is a rising star in Austrian economics. He translated all of my questions into Spanish and then we had him checked by a local, so he's from Argentina, then we had him checked by uh, a Guatemalan for local dialect differences administered the questions in Spanish and then retranslated them back into English. It was a written survey uh, that we did with workers outside of the firms without the firm's permission. Um, then when I visited the sweatshops, I had a local with me translating there, which was interesting because the local owner was Korean and his Korean to Spanish or English was both equally bad, so it was an interesting conversation. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so next question. How extensive has the Marxian uh, class struggle theory played into the anti-sweatshop movement? I don't know. I mean, it makes some people silly. Uh, <laughs> I, for, the, for the workers in the third world country, I think less so. To 
first world activist. I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't know about economics who get dragged into it, and maybe some of them are Marxian class struggle people. Whoever wrote the question, write a follow-up and make me be more specific. I'm not sure I know where to go with it. Okay. You can come back to it if other people ask. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Um, let me give me one second. Let me scroll down. Okay. Oftentimes, the alternative for a child for a child working in a sweatshop is going to school rather than becoming a prostitute or, or starving. In my opinion, an, an, an uneducated youth can stifle economic growth more than eliminating sweatshops. How should a free market economist tackle this problem? So, one, it's important to realize that most children who work also go to school. So they're not direct substitutes. Uh, two, not most, uh, there's a lot of children who don't go to school who don't work. So the relationship's not as ironclad as some people think. Um, second, with this, if you want to, children don't work because their parents are mean. Children work because families are desperately poor. It's overwhelmingly clear that when countries hit middle income status or even upper lower, child labor disappears. It's around seven, eight thousand dollars per capita. Child labor virtually vanishes. So if you get economic growth to that point, child labor takes care of itself. If you want to get rid of child labor before that point, you have to do it with giving them better alternatives. So if, you're, if there was going to be a role for activists, and by the way, I do think we have to make a distinction between people polarized as government and market. There's actually three things. There's government, market, and civil society. I'd say market and civil society are both part of the voluntary order, whereas government is coerced order. I think there's a role for civil society charities that can be productive here. If you raise money to create programs where you pay children to go to school rather than work, you solve that problem. They're working because they need the income. If you pay them to go to school rather than work, then it allowed you've expanded their options, not contracted, and allowed them to build human capital while um, simultaneously earning income. Furthermore, I don't think the argument of poverty trap, meaning children are working, therefore they don't build human capital, therefore the country doesn't grow, therefore it's stuck, it just doesn't hold. If you look at the rates of child labor in any of these poor countries, it's so small relative to the total group of children that it can't explain the stagnation of poverty in the country. The country should be able to grow anyway, independent of some children working. You're up again, Leah. Okay, great. Ne awesome. Next question. Um, even if it's the case that sweatshops are good alter alternatives for third world workers, can it still be the case that these workers are being exploited because their economic opportunity sets are artificially limited by the activities of the respective governments? I don't know if I want to call it exploited, but there's a, there's a big uh, point in this question that I think is completely valid. There are background injustices that make these countries poor and that limit worker alternatives. And a major background injustice is that they suffer under oppressive governments that suppress economic liberties. That said, given that that's the case, does foreign capital coming in, making investments, make these workers worse off or better off? I think the unequivocal answer is still that it improves the lives of the workers. So if we're just going to make a consequentialist argument, it's not exploiting them, it's using their labor makes both the employer and the employee better off. That said, I do think, particularly for students of Liberty Group, we have to be clear about crony capitalism versus capitalism. And in some states, in some instances, employers can go in and corrupt the governments of these countries to limit worker alternatives and maybe give them um, monopsony power as a buyer of labor in an area. So if Nike goes in and gets permission to open a factory but make sure that Reebok doesn't have permission, that that is a bad thing that we should be opposed to and lobby against. Um, but we have to be fairly careful about exactly. So we have to be careful about distinguishing whether there's a background injustice of claiming they have a bad government versus does the injustice come from the company trying to come in and create jobs. 
we need to distinguish between the two. Um, do you think agitation against sweatshops has anything to do with preserving labor standards in first world nations? Ha ha, of course, yes. Um, it's no accident that Unite is involved in this and the AFL-CIO is. Listen, if, the union, if a union has a job, it's to raise the wages and working conditions of its members. There's a trivial fraction of third world workers who are members of these unions in the United States. That means the, work, the unions supposedly are doing this out of worker solidarity around the world. BS. That's not why people pay union dues. What happens is they understand that the relationship between third world labor and first world labor is substitutes. So if they can raise the cost either through working conditions or wage mandates of third world workers, then it's going to decrease the amount of them who are hired and then increase the number of union workers in the United States who are hired to produce these same products. Uh, even though first world workers have higher wages, they also have higher productivity. So they're not one for one substitutes, but they're still substitutes. The unions will understand this. Unfortunately, they take the, the cause of sweatshop workers uh, in their name, but then do things that hurt sweatshop workers. People who claim to be friends of sweatshop workers but advocate for things that will unemploy them are not their friends. Uh, our, this question is kind of long, um, so I'll try to shorten it while I read it. Um, I understand that we shouldn't ban the best opportunities um, which do exist, but this process of development abstracts the market to an extent which is misleading. We are market forces, you and I, everyone listening. Shouldn't we use our influence to support firms which don't use chemicals, which result in cancer clusters? which allow for a fuller conception of human development. Um, I understand that people choose this as their best option, but consumers ought to value more that people who produce their goods and not merely in relative sense, relative to developing economies. Um, this isn't really an economics question, but it's more of a question for philosophers regarding how we ought to treat each other. If the market is to be clear so that we supply is demand, or yeah, so that what supply is demanded we have responsibility to demand for a more dignified conception of human dignity. No, I think it is a question for economics, not just philosophers. Um, so two parts to this. One, to the extent that we value this in the first world, we should express it through our demands for products. So being transparent about what companies are doing and what policies they have and if buyers have a desire to pay more to make sure that they're not buying products that are causing cancer for the workers, that's completely compatible with my argument. And companies will adopt it as a branding and marketing strategy then. What's not compatible with it would be saying we ought to pass a law that mandates they can't use these production processes because it might create cancer for the workers and then cuts off the fact that a lot of consumers might not be willing to pay for it, and as a result, workers would be unemployed and thrown into worse alternatives. We could also advocate for transparency for the workers, that they know what they're working with. So there's a difference between safety and health, and that safety is very transparent to workers. You get feedback quickly um, and can adjust whether you want to work there or not. Health is more complex to understand. But at the same time, we also have to look at average life expectancies of these countries. If it's something that might cause cancer at age 70, that's not relevant for a worker who's probably going to die at 55 or 60. Um, so it's completely irrational for them to take a job that involves working with those chemicals as well. So I think the question's a good one, but it's, not, uh, it's clearly the case that economics still has something to say about it, uh, and it's not clear that that makes an exception to the general case that I've made. Okay, next question. Uh, a lot of people within the anti-sweatshop movement complain about female workers being sexually assaulted, raped, or physically abused at the sweatshop due to their employers enforcing a faster working pace. Others complain about workers in China who have allegedly committed suicide while working in a sweatshop due to stress. As libertarians, how do we address these concerns without defending the actions that take place 
or getting into heated arguments. Oh boy, now you've done it. All right. So these are tougher questions, or at least more uncomfortable ones, but I don't think outside the process. First, actually, suicide. This is the first time anybody's raised that to me. I don't think if someone commits suicide because they're stressed by their job in a sweatshop or anything else, it's on the hands of anybody but the person who committed suicide. Uh, if they chose that as what they believe to be their best option, well, then so be it. Um, as for the sexual harassment part, I'll take a little bit different tack than normal with the Students for Liberty group. I presume that a Students for Liberty group believes that workers should be able to sell sex for money, i.e. prostitution should be legal or capitalist acts between consenting adults should. If you have that position, it seems weird to me that if sex for money should be legal and sewing for money should be legal, you couldn't combine sex and sewing together and then sell yourself for that, assuming no one's using violence to get you to do it. So in principle, it seems that it would be okay. Now, of course, there's principal agent problems in sweatshops where it could be managers trying to take advantage of their position as managers where the owners don't condone it. But sexual harassment on the job is part of working conditions, just like the long wages, the unpredictable hours, or other things, which means if you're at greater risk for it, in order to get you to take the job, they have to pay you what economists call a compensating differential, higher wages. So there was actually just recently an economics paper studying United States markets, not sweatshops but looking at rates of sexual harassment in the United States professions. And it found, sure enough, that in those professions where sexual harassment was more prevalent, once you control for other factors, workers earned more money. Meaning, basically, it's a compensating differential, just like health, safety, or any other working conditions. Workers get paid more when they're at greater risk for it, and they voluntarily accept that, which means the net package makes workers better off. So as uncomfortable or distasteful as that topic might be, it doesn't fall outside of the normal analysis of wages and working conditions. Thanks for pushing me on that one. <laughs> it has to, the question has to come out somehow. Um, moving on. Do you think the U.S. Constitution applies, at least in regards to uh, labor rights, in sweatshop countries where U.S. Uh, chartered corporations are operating there? Or at least, uh, do you think it should apply? Um, no. Uh, I'm not sure what aspect of the con First of all, actually, honestly, I don't care about the Constitution per se. To the extent that the Constitution is consistent with some version of natural rights and economic efficiency, I think it's great. To the extent that it's not, I don't. But my litmus test is never whether something's legal by Constitution or legislation in the United States and whether that's right or wrong. So I think you should, so I didn't bring this up before, there's labor laws in other countries that I think companies should break. And I think they should break them if our metric is the welfare of the workers. So this is a contrast between what Hayek would call uh, law versus legislation. Uh, just because legislation is there, it can be inconsistent with law, and it can also be worse for the workers. So uh, for instance, if a country has a law that mandates a particular minimum wage above worker productivity, when firms violate that and pay below the minimum wage, I think that's a good thing, and I think it's a good thing for the workers. Uh, so we shouldn't, the rule of law doesn't mean just following whatever legislation happens to exist. It means following principles outside of that. Okay, great. And let's do one more question, um, and then we'll end the webinar for this evening. Um, if we seek the freedom to have everything we demand, excluding NAP violations supplied, 
shouldn't we encourage all demanders to value how people are treated and not merely in a relative sense? Uh, the ability to choose freely must be associated with people choosing wisely, or our world may not be a very beautiful place. We are the regulators, and we must take our charge seriously. Yeah, I think that's per perfectly fine. Uh, to the extent that consumers demand particular things, the market will respond to them, and uh, wanting better treatment for the workers is fine. With the caveat, though, that it means you need to be able, its it's got to be, in economic speak, a shift in demand, not a movement along a demand curve. So you simply can't mandate higher compensation because you're moving along a demand curve. Instead, what there has to be is a movement of consumers who are more willing to purchase at any given price because workers are treated more ethically, then it's a shift out in the demand curve and you can employ a greater quantity of worker at the same or higher wages. So otherwise, simply mandating these things would end up throwing some workers into worse alternatives, and that's bad for them. And I'd also like to conclude by saying, since I was talking to you all, I do this talk on a lot of college campuses. Maybe some of you would like to have me out. Uh, email me or Google me, and you can find me easily. But then uh, email me and figure it out. You need a budget, and I need a good speaking fee. But uh, I'm happy to do this on many college campuses, and I've debated it with uh, anti-sweatshop people as well as just giving normal talks. It's it's usually fun. With that, Leah, thank you for hosting this, and uh, I enjoyed talking with you all tonight. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you to all of our participants this evening. Um, I hope you can all continue coming back to our webinars to learn more throughout the year. This week, we'll announce our um, October web webinars, so be sure to keep your eyes out for that announcement. On a final note, shortly you will be emailed a follow-up email where you will uh, find more detailed information about SFL as well as a survey to evaluate the webinar. Please take a couple minutes to fill it out. It helps us know how to improve our programs and makes these webinars more interesting for you. And with that, I think we're officially wrapped up. Thank you again for your time, Ben, um, and have a wonderful evening, everyone. You still there, Leah?